Uh, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this another series of uh, Indian Academy of Echo Learning Programs. And uh, today we have one of the best teacher of echocardiography to be very precise cardiology with us, none other than Professor G. Vijay Raghman. If I try to introduce him, so him is a very difficult task for me. I only share that uh, he is born in 1942 on 18th of September. He has got almost 42 years of a dedicated, 48 years of a dedicated cardiology services. He was the first one to create a very advanced cardiology center in Trivandrum Medical College after doing his DM cardiology and then subsequently serving internationally, came back to India and established the famous Kerala Institute of Medical Sciences, where he's the vice chairman, director of medical services, dean academics, and senior consultant cardiology. That's in nutshell, I can speak him. He's for me, one of the best blessing person. I always take his blessing for any work which I do. And it's fortunate enough for me to share the platform with him today. I can't say I can't be moderator or a chairperson, but I can only say that I can share a platform with him. And that's my fortunate today. With these few words, let me hand over my mic to none other than Padam Shri Professor Vijay Raghavan Ji, sir. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh. You always spell out a lot of nice words. And In fact, sir, you deserve a lot. These are nothing in fact. <laughs> Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you. Today, we are going to deal with uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. And uh, the that's just a point, yeah. Restricted cardiomyopathy. See, the commonest restricted cardiomyopathy in this part of the world, I, I talk about my place. That's Kerala, used to be endocardial, tropical endomyocardial fibrosis. That's why it titled it as tropical endomyocardial fibrosis and other restricted cardiomyopathies. The tropical endomyocardial fibrosis is a rare disease and which is waning off and you don't find as many cases as before. Well, many classifications of restricted cardiomyopathies and presenting the primary one, the primary idiopathic restrictive cardiomyopathy, and secondary, so many things, infiltrative, endomyocardial fibrosis, lawless, inflammatory sarcoidosis, post radiation, storage diseases, hemochromatosis, neuromuscular disorders, connective tissue diseases, and like pseudosarthoma, elasticum. This 14 year old student was brought by his elder sister, who was a doctor in our institution, for effort-related fatigue and distension of abdomen. One sibling died of heart disease in childhood. Clinically, he was in congestive heart failure when he presented to us. You see, he was near normal. Just extra short, mild cardiomegaly with biatrial enlargement. Large test showed anemia. And this was the echo picture. The most prominent thing being marked dilatation of the left atrium. LB appeared near normal here, fairly good contractility. Iota is normal. And you find the left atrium is markedly enlarged. So is the right atrium. So is the right atrium. The right ventricle looks all right, and the pulmonary artery looks normal. This is the finding that we found in the parasternal long and short axis wheel. Coming to the four chamber view, what we found was ventricle chambers appeared near normal with little reduced rejection fraction. But look at the atrial chambers. Atrial chambers were markedly dilated, both right and left atrium. And there is no systolic shortening. There is no systolic shortening of the, of the, of the ventricles in the longitudinal direction, which is very striking. When you did the M mode, M mode is very interesting. 
there is a there is a l l wave in the m mode l wave in the m mode indicating very high very high dastly pressures elevated filling pressures and you find there are a lot of delayed myocardial relaxation and the heart rate is on the slower side but heart rate is on the slower side looking at the diastolic function look at the sharp decline of the e wave deceleration time is only 87 milliseconds it is only 75 milliseconds in the tricuspid valve there's a short lived rapid inflow of phase in both mitral and the tricuspid valves the aortic velocity was less than 1 meters per second looking at the looking at the deceleration slope you could classify it as stage 4 diastolic dysfunction e by e prime 12.3 there is neither here nor there less than 8 is normal 8 to 15 is suspicious above 15 is abnormal you find the s waves are the little smaller s waves of s waves 4 cm normally should be 68 cm s waves are smaller and you look at the deceleration slope and the other parameters the e by e prime comes to stage 2 diastolic dysfunction so you have enough evidence to say that this patient has left heart failure high la pressure dilated la l wave in mitral valve m mod e by e prime slightly increase but it has to be stressed that e by e prime very promptly responds to a diuretic this e by e prime done after diuretic patient got diuretics could the reduction of e by e prime could have been due to diuretics mitral inflow doppler type for diastolic dysfunction near normal ejection fraction aortic velocity was less than 4 meters per second all signs of right heart failure with high ra pressure so in addition to the left heart failure we had evidence of right heart failure and look at the look at the hepatic vein flow into the right atrium normally hepatic vein drains with maximal velocity into the right atrium during systole during systole in systole right atrium is in diastole it is distending so that the filling pressure is minimal so all the blood can flow and this factor that in diastole in in systole there is hardly any flow indicates that the ra pressure is high the flow from the hepatic vein to the right ventricle occurs or right atrium right ventricle occurs only when the tricuspid valve is open otherwise it just can't flow because of systemic venous pressure remains high this is the classical idiopathic restrictive cardiomyopathy there is a family history of a child dying in in a age group caused by mutations of in sarcomeric disease genes may coexist with hcm in the same family diagnosis can be done only by endomarker myocardial biopsy with good histochemistry facilities prognosis is very bad our patient we lost in 11 months after the diagnosis let us look how to define restrictive cardiomyopathy european society defined it as restrictive ventricular physiology in the presence of normal or reduced diastolic volumes of one or both ventricles reduced systolic volumes and normal ventricular wall thickness american heart association called defined it as primary restrictive card, non hypertrophic cardiomyopathy it is a rare form of heart muscle disease and a cause of heart failure that is characterized by normal or decreased volume of both ventricles associated with biatrial enlargement normal lv wall thickness and av valves impaired ventricular filling and restrictive physiology normal or near normal systolic function and there's a definition of american heart and the classification i took it from the 14th edition of hirschel law myocardial endocardial or epipericardial myocardial is a primary restrictive cardiomyopathy multi organ genetic disease 
acquired phenocopies of diabetes and chronic toxicity, insulin and diseases, endocardial, endocardial fibroelastosis, endomyocardial fibrosis, carcinoid heart disease, drug induced like methicillin. We hardly see it nowadays. Epipericardial is pericarditis, transplant hearts, postpericardiotomy syndrome, etc. This is how it's classified. Let us look at the 65 year old businessman. Came to the cardiac surgeon with a coronary angiogram showing triple vessel disease and taken a four bypass surgery. Unfortunately, echo was missed in the first center and in our center also. Those patients went straight to, for the surgeon and surgery was done. Surgeon reported myocardium was looking very odd at surgery. Postoperatively, we found him in cardiac failure. And this is what we found. We found that we found that his LV, he has LVH with a normal cavity size, normal cavity size, and poor contractility. The brightness of myocardium was striking, which is classical of infiltrative cardiomyopathy. And the poor contractility is overshadowed by the slow relaxation and compliance and compliance on second let me get the point out sorry sorry Just by trying to find out why the, why the, why the. Is is a laser pointer, sir? Laser pointer. Yeah. Uh, the, why why it's not moving? I don't know. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. The poor contractility is overshadowed by the slow relaxation and compliance, and compliance that we found. The gradual contraction, the gradual contraction, slow relaxation of the myocardium was very evident and ejection fraction was 50.4%. But looking at the flow through the mitral valve, we found that the, the desolation time was very fast, 102, and he had all signs of type 4 diastolic dysfunction. Look at the, look at the infiltration See, infiltration involved not only the myocardium, but the aortic wall and the aortic valve, the mitral valve. In fact, every structure of the heart was involved in the infiltrative process. Look at the, look at the, look at the atrium. Intratrial septum is very classical. And it was involved every part of the myocardium. And this is a, the, the involvement of the valve is not a common feature of amyloidosis. It's a very late phase and a rare, rare form of amyloidosis. We found the S waves were also less. E by E prime was 75 and flow velocity propagation was 30 centimeters per, per second. And this is to show that the, the valve leaflets were markedly thickened and it is not really opening totally fully. And this affected Aortic valve, the mitral valve, the pulmonary valve, every valve it, it involved, it involved. And mitral leaflets were thickened with mild mitral regurgitation, as you may find here. As you may find here. More interesting was that the tricuspid valve, that's a tricuspid valve, was thickened and stenosed. The both thick, bogey tricuspid valve was finding it very difficult to open completely ultimately resulting in a mean gradient of 3.39. 3.39 at a peak gradient of 5.71. There was an element of tricuspid stenosis produced by the thick, bogey tricuspid leaflets. And you look at the look at the longitudinal strain, it is very characteristic. You find a cherry on top with all the basal segments having lost their contractility. Look at these. You find 
apical segments are contracting while the basal segments are echinetic. Some other segments are actually lengthening. So longitudinal strain was extremely low in every segment except the cardiac apex. There was some tricuspidic agitation but a low, low velocity. Patient was in right heart failure in addition to left heart failure. And when you look at it, you find that You find that the the, the flow, again the flow the hepatic veins the flow is in dastly no systolic this is actually atrial systolic flow that you find here this is atrial systolic flow it's a dastly flow no systolic flow into the into the into the right atria twenty eight year old housewife. This was a cardiac amyloidosis with severe restrictive physiology. Another example of restrictive cardiomyopathy. The 28-year-old housewife was sitting with ascites. Patient was referred from a gastroenterology department. The patient went there for ascites. And they found an elevated JVP. She had effort-induced fatigue for two years, ascites for one year, very little dependent edema, clinically thin-built lady, Obvious society and grade 2 dyspnea, heart rate 84, blood pressure 110 by 80, market cardiomegaly, apex felt in the sixth, left intercostal space in midaxial line, heart sounds normal, no murmurs, liver 4 centimeters below costal margin, spleen not enlarged, chest x-ray short, market cardiomegaly with the RH shadow occupying most of the right chest. ECG was Q1 and V1 very characteristically. Blood test showed anemia, LFT and RFT were normal. Most striking was the echocardiogram. The parasternal window itself is nowhere in the parasternal. We can get these image, parasternal views, parasternal views only when you put the transducer in the near the mid axillary line. The whole left side of the structures were shifted to the left and posteriorly so that the parasternal window was in the mid line. The LV was near normal on measurement. Mitral well was normal, IRT well was normal, and the whole heart was occupied by the right heart. Right heart has pushed the left heart, left heart completely, completely to the posteriorly and to the left. And that was the characteristic feature of this particular patient. We found that the systolic function was near normal. Look at the S waves. The lateral, LV lateral analyst TDS was near normal, 11 and 9. MPA was also normal in the left ventricle. LV DASLI function, mitral E 810, lateral analyst 170, and E by E prime was also normal. But look at the right side. Everything was grossly abnormal in the right side. This is the right atrium and right ventricle. Left ventricle and left atrium. They were so diminutive. It looked as if the huge right atrium and right ventricle together pushed everything to the left. Left ventricle shows good contractility, except over the apex. Epical fibrosis is evident. Systolic function appears normal. This was the peculiar finding. And the only condition where you find such things is something like a, a grossly abnormal Epstein's disease. But was it Epstein? No. When you look at the four chamber view in the ven in you look concentrate on the ventricles, there is something very, very unique. During diastole, the high RV diastole pressure push high RV diastole pressure 
push the basal and basal and mid septum. Sorry. Yeah, this is diastole. In diastole, the septum is pushed towards the left, but in systole, it is coming back to the right. During diastole, high RV diastole pressures pushes the basal and mid IVS towards the LV. During systole, free tricuspid regurgitation reduces the RV systolic pressure and hence the IVS, IVS falls towards the right ventricle. This peculiar structure is very unique for endomyocardial fibrosis. The whole system is centered on a very high systemic venous pressure. Systemic high venous pressure, but the diastolic pressure in the, in the RV is much, much higher than LV, so that in diastole, the interventricular septum is pushed towards the left ventricle. In systole, because the TR is coming back. And this is a very unique feature of right ventricle endomyocardial fibrosis. You look at the the, the RV, RV apex is fibrosed and diminutive. Whole RV looks like a thimble. Whole, whole RV looks like a thimble. It's because of fibrosis. And one unique thing is that the fibrosis do not, do not extend into the basal and mid part of the intraventricular septum. Fibrosis of the apical septum do not take part in the systolic contraction. The apical free wall of the RV also did not take part of systolic contraction, resulting in a dimple. Look here. There's a dimple here. This is very unique, absolutely unique. The, epi the dimple, uh, RV apical dimple in both systole and diastole. It's, you can see it here. It is here. Interventricular septum is here. This is the RV apical dimple. It is seen in systole and diastole due to pulling of the RV apical fibrosis. Similar dimple could be seen in systole between mid and apical IVS. And we could, I, I demonstrated this in the, in the color coded, the, the, the Altec Brompton encoder long back. This was in 1982-83. These are all fibrous tissue. And here you find the apical dimple. And in the atopsid heart, you can see the dimple very clearly. This was described very much by the African workers from Kampala. Davis described the apical dimple as characteristic of the morphological abnormality of RV endomyocardial fibrosis. You look at the, the leaflets of the tricuspid valve. Leaflets are short and stumpy, and all the three leaflets are in all the three leaflets are involved, and resulting in severe low velocity tricuspid regurgitation. RV is reduced to a thimble like chamber. And that's RV and the dilated right atrium. The tricuspid regurgitation that occurs is a very low velocity TR of varying degree of a low pressure TR, of a low pressure TR. 11.58 millimeters of mercury is the only gradient during TR. The RA dilatation is aneurysmal. But in addition, look at the right ventricle outflow tract. Look, RV outflow tract is hyperdynamic. Can you see this? RV outflow tract is hyperdynamic. And this RV outflow tract measures 5.5 centimeters. Dilated, hyperdynamic RV outflow tract, very clearly visualized. Very clearly visualized. This we demonstrated long back in the 70s when I was working in Velour. In the angiogram, this is the outflow tract, dilate outflow tract, and it's hyperdynamic, hyperdynamic, as you see here. Hyperdynamic, dilate. The whole pumping chamber of the right side of the heart is the RV outflow tract. It's the RV outflow tract which pumps and propels the blood forwards. It propels the blood forwards. This is also unique for RV endomyocardial fibrosis. The high venous pressure, the high systemic venous pressure pushes on forwards to the right atrium, transmitted to the left, right, right ventricle. And this opens the pulmonary valve in diastole. Opens the pulmonary valve in diastole. Following the P wave, the right atrial transport is transmitted to the right ventricle. And the pressure in the right ventricle rises above the 
pulmonary artery pressure and in diastole the pulmonary valve opens this can be seen in color as well as in the pulse wave and this also uh, I, we could, this could happen not only in sinus rhythm but even in even in atrial fibrillation you find the progress a high systemic venous pressure may open the pulmonary valve intermittently and there is a could be continuous flow as in in fontan post fontan patients this we demonstrated that in in by using a captive manometer that is in 1977 captive manometer and a wave in the pulmonary artery tracing and a wave in the pulmonary artery tracing at the time there was no 2d echo no doppler and what we demonstrated in the 1970s published in american heart journal in 1980s is demonstrable by doppler echocardiography as atrial systolic opening of the pulmonary valve in right side of in the myocardial fibrosis the and right atrial dilatation is a most classical feature here the here the treated the ml is a volume of right atrium and the high venous pressure keeps the ivc distended distended hepatic venous pressure curve the 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 the, the, the hepatic venous flow into the right atrium again is only in diastole not the classical normal systolic flow i have demonstrated 10 diagnostic signs of right sided endomyocardial fibrosis left heart dysplasia of the left heart structure aneurysmal dilatation of the right atrium thimble like right ventricle fibro stricospect valve rv apical fibrosis and calcification rv apical dimple left heart diastolic displacement of intraventricular septum dilated hyperdynamic right ventricular outflow tract diastolic opening of the pulmonary valve is a diastolic forward flow dilated ivc and hepatic veins more than 50% of this will be positive in all patients with endomyocardial fibrosis but 10 signs which classically occurs i have demonstrated looking at the left side of the heart yeah, for the first left heart left ventricular endomyocardial fibrosis was described by me when i was working in vello a 38 year old symptomatic young man referred for an ecg showing lv at the strain this patient came to me about 10 years back clinically no abnormality chest x ray lv apical calcification ecg lv at the strain the parastonal long axis view the aortic valve here you can see the whole lv apex is filled with fibrosis with calcification but lv inflow tract is normal and you can see in the four chamber view apex is completely obliterated with fibrosis and calcification but inflow tract is functioning very well inflow tract is functioning very well and this patient did not have much of mitral regurgitation which normally occurs which is not normally which occurs in patients with lv and the myocardial fibrosis who are symptomatic the patient was asymptomatic mainly because there is not much of look at the not much of mitral regurgitation why they are symptomatic normally functioning lv inflow tract normally functioning lv outflow tract mild or minimal mitral regurgitation as the mitral apparatus is spared in such patients e by e prime is normal these are the, the these are the types of patients which turn up today which are missed in the routine examination these are types of patients which are these are burned out in the myocardial fibrosis which may takes probably 20 or 30 years for them to become symptomatic and come to you in congestive heart failure another patient a 60 year old lady was in with dyspnea on exertion class 2 for 15 years which progressed to class 3 since one month reason worsening of dyspnea a 3 by 6 injection systolic murmur at the upper right sternal border radiating to the carotids and aortic aortic systolic murmur was very well audible and echocardiogram parastonal long axis view definitely showed an aortic stenosis a calcified aortic valve with narrowing systolic doming and there's marked la enlargement lv hypertrophy is not pronounced you may find some signs of some signs of lv apical fibrosis and 
the tricuspid valve, which is calcified, and you find LV to iota P gradient was 71. Mean gradient is 41. The apical, the LV apical fibrosis and calcification, you find cal the shelves of calcium involving the LV apex. LV apex is a kinetic. LV inflow tract is absolutely normal. Inflow tract is absolutely normal, normally contracted. Fibrosis do not involve even the outflow tract. It is very characteristic that even in the involvement of the mitral valve, the LV fibrosis will not extend to the outflow tract. It will stop as an endocardial ridge, which has been described by the pathologist even in the past. Many of these patients should look carefully to the other ventricle also. And you look carefully, there is some apical fibrosis of the right ventricle too. So many a time, presentation with dominant LV or dominant RV, involvement of the other ventricle could be minimal, minimal. And this is a patient with, uh, with the a patient with classically with aortic stenosis with endomicral fibrosis. And presenting this patient as a patient from Kerala, unless he came from Kerala, we would not have thought of the diagnosis. What happened to the posterior mitral leaflet? Not only that there is the mitral leaflet, posterior mitral leaflet is not very clearly seen. There's a shelf of calcium, shelf of calcium in the posterior inferior radius. Whole mitral apparatus is shifted posteriorly, shifted posteriorly, and it is very obvious that the posterior mitral leaflet is plastered on, plastered on to the posterior mitral, mitral, uh, posterior left ventricular wall along with the posterior papillary muscle. And this is the mitral orifice shifted posteriorly, and the M mode also. You could see only a trace of trace of posterior leaflet, if at all. You can you can you have anything left. The the, the shelf of calcium was the, was extending as as you go towards the apex, just more and more, more and more, and very characteristic. The anterior mitral leaflet was near normal. So this cannot be a this cannot be a rheumatic heart disease because it is spares the anterior leaflet and involves the posterior leaflet. In addition, there is a myocardial calcification with marked endocardial thickening extending towards the apex. This is demonstrating the posterior mitral posterior left ventricular wall calcification. The E by E prime was 17.58, 17.58, and you had some mit mitral regurgitation. And but mitral regurgitation, we look at it as early and mid, more in the early and mid mitral regurgitation. And this mitral regurgitation was because of the posterior mitral lethal being plastered on the posterior valve. And when you did the did the strain, you find that you find that. The apical strain is retained, but peripheral, peripheral basal strains are lost to some extent. Lost to some extent. This patient had any posterior shelf of calcium. Mitral postal leaflet merged into calcific deposits. No LV apical calcification. Normal LVEM, LA dilatation, elevated mitral E by E prime, early systolic mitral regurgitation, normal global longitudinal strain. The earlier patient in whom we had been treating with LBE above had more mitral regurgitation and resulted in LB early pulmonary hypertension and they needed surgery like mitral replacement and LV endocardiectomy. Left ventricular endomyocardial fibrosis was our, uh, our diagnosing this patient without LV apical calcification. Just as I listed diagnostic signs of RVEMF. This is the diagnostic sign of LVEMF. LV apical fibrosis with calcification. LV cavity is seldom dilated. Fibrosis and plastering of posterior mitral cusp to posterior left ventricular wall. Andromitral leaflet is intact. Left atrial enlargement of mild to moderate degree. Pulmonary hypertension. E by E prime more than 15. Sometimes LV thrombus. 
fibrosis stops at the base of one third of the IV septum, varying degree of mitral regurgitation. At least 50 percent of these signs will be present in every one with endomycal fibrosis. Every one with endomycal fibrosis. Which investigation is more informative at the least and least expensive? MRI versus echodoppler. MRI is more conclusive, but echo is the least expensive. MRI could demonstrate a large area of fibrosis as well as the area of area of late gadolinium, late gadolinium enhancement of the fibrous tissue, a late gadolinium enhancement of the fibrous tissue, and this is this is diagnostic of LV and the myocardial fibrosis. Let us look at 36-year-old businessman. Recent onset of mild fever, dyspnea and cough, clinically febrile, patient looking sick and tired. After 84, BP 110 by 80, AUP 9 centimeters, mild cardiomegaly, apical gallop, mild mitral regurgitation, hormone venous congestion x ray, LV strain. And this is what we found. The whole LV was covered with a fibrinous or thrombus like material, more on the LV apex and can trace it up to the, up to the base. Epical layer of inflammatory, inflammatory, exudatory thrombus and pitiful eosinophilia was very characteristic. And this was Loeffler syndrome, hyper eosinophilic cardiomyopathy, Loeffler syndrome, and thrombus formation is very classical. Thrombus formation with endocardial thickening is very characteristic of Loeffler syndrome. 14-year-old boy admitted for, in the medical ICU for dengue hemorrhagic fever for four days. He was shifted to our ICU because he developed central chest pain, which lasted for five minutes or more. My examination, tachycardia, P100 by 70, no cardiomegaly, heart sounds normal. The soft LVS3, other systems were normal. Looking at the ECG, find there was evidence of ST elevation in 2, 3 ABM and and yeah, and ST depression 1 AVL, 1 AVL. Classical, classical inferior myocardial infarction. Without the history of dengue fever and suspicion of dengue myocarditis, he would have immediately, immediately gone in for an angiogram in this young boy which we did not, we, we controlled ourselves. We did not go ahead with an, to an angiogram. Chest X-ray was LV failure, troponin went to 3,000 picograms. CKB was 18.5 and transthoracic echo was near normal, near normal. Good, good systolic function. But when you look at the Dasley function, stage four Dasley heart failure, Stage for Dastly heart failure. And he found stage two, the, the E by E prime was mildly elevated, mildly elevated, not really, not really striking stage two. But pulmonary venous flow was abnormal. Just like the systemic venous flow is maximally in systole, pulmonary venous flow should also be maximally in dastly, because the left atrium also undergoes diastole and relaxation in leprosy is lowest in systole so the maximal flow occurs but here it is the reverse in systole flow was less in diastole flow was more systole flow was less diastole flow was more this indicated a stage three diastolic dysfunction if you carefully do in about 80, 80 to 85 percent of the patients you can get a good pulmonary venous flow pattern we decided to go ahead and do a late gadolinium uh, enhancement of the LV, LV myocardium because we thought the angiogram will only show you yes or no of obstruction. We wanted to know what is wrong with the myocardium. We wanted to know what is wrong with the myocardium. We found that the late gadolinium enhancement in the LV was of the epicardium, epicardium and not of the endocardium. Classically, the Nishkimi heart disease, uh, or such diseases, all late gordon limb enhancement starts with the endocardium and goes on to epicardium. 
in inflammatory diseases, it involves the epicardium and goes on to endocardium. It's the late gordon in enhancement MRI, which really showed the diagnosis. Great diastolic dysfunction was the only abnormality in the dengue myocarditis. Inflammatory, reversible, restrictive cardiomyopathy. So when you look at cardiomyopathies, please remember, it extends from a spectrum of diseases, from congenital idiopathic restrictive cardiomyopathy towards endomycal fibrosis, even though it is it is common in Kerala, it has been described from Andhra Pradesh, and there have been plenty of specimens in the KEM hospital, Bombay, as well as in Chandigarh. So it is national, present all over India, but in, in small numbers. So restrictive cardiomyopathy is defined as restrictive ventricular physiology in the presence of normal or reduced diastolic volumes of one or both ventricles, reduced systolic volumes and normal ventricular wall thickness. I like that definition of European Society of Cardiology. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. And I'm very happy to bring you greetings and best wishes from all the staff at the Kerala Institute of Medical Sciences. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir, for your nice and extensive depiction of multiple cases of restrictive cardiomyopathies. I'm sure like all the participants must have been benefited with this kind of a uh, elucidative presentation. And now I look forward from the participants some questions if they want to ask. And with this, I can have some questions in the chat box. There's none over there right now. Uh, I'll get the ball rolling. Uh, Professor Vijayaragwan, sir, like we have many parameters for diastolic function evaluations today. Like uh, we talk of uh, E to E prime ratio, E A ratio, then deceleration time. Which one is the most appropriate uh, method of evaluation of a diastolic function, especially in restrictive cardiomyopathies? I record the few of the few of the few of the diastolic function. I find E by E prime. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, sir. Please. I find the E by E prime extremely useful even today. In fact, E by E prime is an abnormality which you can which you can find out. Only, only if you treat the patient, if you get the patient before diuretics. E by E prime is a phenomenon which occurs transiently, unless the patient is a chronic heart failure. A, a patient admitted with acute left ventricular failure, ischemic heart disease. You give a diuretic, E by E prime may become normal, but immediately after admission, you find E by E prime will be abnormal. And a long-standing heart disease, that's where the LA dilatation comes. The LA volume comes. The LA volume comes. And that's where you find the, 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 the other, other features are useful. The E by E prime is still the best measure and followed by the deceleration time. Deceleration time is also equally sensitive. Deceleration time is also equally sensitive to the degree of diastolic dysfunction. The, all the other measurements are relative, I would say, are relative. And I have used once the, the, the permanent venous flow pattern. I mean, at least about 14 signs of diastolic function, but these two or three are most useful among them. Thank you, sir. Uh, questions have started pouring in. The first question is how to differentiate calcification from scarring in a myocardium on echocardiography? We have to understand that when you do a 2D echo, the, the, the brightness depends on the amount of fibrous tissue. The maximum fibrous tissue is at the annulus and the aortic wall. If any structure is brighter than the aortic wall, it is more towards calcium. The brighter the structure, the more towards the calcium. 
in addition when the calcium is dense you find ghost shadows also appear that's how you identify compare with the compare with the pericardium compare with the aortic wall anything more br brighter than the pericardium and the aortic wall is calcium unless otherwise proved plus if you have the calcium you find ghost shadows appear Let's go on to the next question. This is like your GLS is low, but what happens to circumferential stain in these subset of population of restricted the, blood over? I did not touch the radial stain or circumferential strain because we have we do not have enough data in various diseases on these two strains to talk about. These two strains are still remaining within the within the within the field of experimental science. Other than the clinical side, only the longitudinal strain has come in as a clinical tool for day-to-day -to -day use. That's why I did not go into the circumferential strain. Obviously, there are abnormalities in circumferential strain to which I will not be going into detail. The next question has come: Is in an unexplained dilated right atrium with a non-coapting tricuspid valve, should we always suspect EMF? How to further confirm the diagnosis and treat them, and what other differential diagnosis should we consider? And <laughs> you know, the another common cause of non-coaptation of the tricuspid valve with the dilated right atrium is basically post-blood trauma to the chest. That's where I have found it quite often, and uh, any condition with the tricuspid valve. Uh, tra trauma. The earliest thing to involve in the heart is actually tricuspid valve and blunt chest trauma. So, unless you find pathological changes of RV in the RV apex, pathological changes in the RV apex, you cannot you cannot pinpoint it as RV endomyocardial fibrosis. Uh, the next question is: Should ACE inhibitor oblique ARBs? Comma beta blocker and MRA be prescribed to patients with endomyocardial fibrosis. If yes, then how these agents help such patients? The cardiac failure of endomyocardial fibrosis should be treated like any other cardiac failure. However, RV EMF is a special entity altogether because the very high venous pressure, very high venous pressure. Often it is the aldosterone antagonist along with diuretics, which are going to be extremely useful rather than ACE inhibitors or or ARBs. The beta blocker, depending on the heart rate, many patients come to you with atrial fibrillation. Beta blockers or verapamil is the drug of choice that we use because of myocardial involvement. A beta blocker is more useful than the verapamil. Otherwise, the ACE inhibitors and the ARBs we are not used. Unfortunately, this disease was very common in an era where ACE inhibitors and ARBs were not in the mark, not not available to us. So we haven't used much. But the the aldosterone antagonists they used extensively with very good benefit with loop diuretics. The next question has come: Is uh, which part of LV is mostly viewed in a myelodosis? Is it uh, septum, mid wall, basal, or mid LV? As evidenced by the longitudinal strain, the basal wall is a maximally involved. Then the mid wall, and apex is least involved. This can be appreciated even in the 2D echo. That basal wall is. Maximally involved and apex is most of the time spared very well. I think so. The, those are the all questions which we had in a chat box today, and I'm sure like uh, there's no more questions. Can have any other question if they're in the chat box from Kamini. If it's not. Uh, uh, let me pay thanks to Professor Vijay Raghavan sir for his uh, brilliant presentations and a lot of people have learned a lot of things. Even I too have learned a lot many things by looking at his presentation.
and especially I can say that RV EMF I have really seen for the first time where very small RV apex which is fibrosed and temple RV and Hughes dilated RA. So, sir, thank you very much. I'd like to have your concluding remarks for all the people who are present over here, sir. You should always have a, in your mind the possibility of prosthetic cardiomyopathy when you're faced with a difficult to diagnose phase, especially in your lab. Think of restrictive cardiomyopathy. There are so many causes which ultimately result in restrictive cardiomyopathy. And if, it, if, if you think of it, then only you will diagnose. If you did not think of it, you will always miss it. This was the classical case of a, a patient from Kerala, which I demonstrated. So this lecture is mainly made you to think of restrictive cardiomyopathy whenever you have a problem of difficult to diagnose case in your echo lab. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you, Rakesh. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. With this, we'll put an end to this and uh, we look forward for the next series of lectures from Indian Academy of Echocardiography. Thank you. Stay safe and God bless you all. Take care of yourself. The corona is not going to go away. We have to take care of ourselves. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much. You're welcome. You're welcome.